And let's turn in our Bibles to John chapter 10. This morning we have the Lord's Supper. And I think the verses that we have in the Scripture that we've been dealing with really minister to our needs today in the Lord's Supper. So we're going to read verses 39 through 42. John chapter 10 verses 39 through 42. May we stand together, please. And you read aloud with me, beginning in verse 39. And let's read. Therefore they sought again to take him, but he escaped out of their hand, and went away again beyond Jordan into the place where John had first baptized, and there he abode. And many resorted unto him, and said, John did no miracle, but all things that John spake of this man were true, and many believed on him there. Thank you. Be seated, please. I want to talk to you today about going backward in order to go forward. Or when going back means going forward. The desire to return and to go back is some way a possibility through memory and in some ways a physical possibility. Sometimes it can be helpful to go back physically to places. Sometimes it can be very detrimental to your spiritual growth and development. And then we all have the capacity to remember things. And sometimes going back in our memory can be extremely helpful, such as the Lord's Supper. When we take the Lord's Supper, we go back in our memory the time which we read about when Christ died on the cross and shed his blood for us very, very helpful to a Christian. On the other hand, remembering some things, going back to some things in our memory can be very, very hurtful to us. And uh, what may be helpful to one person to remember might be very damaging to another person to remember. Sometimes things we go back to physically turn out to be very different from what we expected. We went back physically expecting to find things a certain way, and we found them very differently. I remember going back years after my grandparents on my mother's side had died to their country home in Alabama. As a boy, we went out there, beautiful, large, frame house, high ceilings, gabled roof, large yard where chickens would roam at will randomly around the yard, beautiful rose bushes in the front yard, well-kept, picket fence going out to the road, and uh, a well-cared-for farm. Years later, when I went back, I believe I was by myself just driving out, out in the country in Alabama, And when I came to the old home place, I hardly recognized it. The house was dilapidated. It needed painting. The yard was grown up in grass, no rose bushes. Nobody lived there, so far as I could tell. It had been abandoned. I didn't feel too good about it. I was almost sorry I went back because... I had seen it when it was in such better shape and so beautiful, and now it wasn't a thing of beauty. And the memories uh, were beautiful, but not the experience of going back. Well, it wasn't a disaster in my life. In other words, my faith and confidence wasn't in that. It was just a disappointment. Sometimes people put all of their energies into some hobby or some uh, pastime. And uh, they think that in pursuing that, that that will bring them everything that they're looking for. And then they, later on, when they they examine it, they find out that 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 isn't really what they wanted. 
or going back to the right things, the, the good things, and particularly the things that Christ went back to uh, are the things that are before us today when going back can mean going forward. And here we find Jesus going back to the place across the Jordan from Jerusalem where John baptized him and where Jesus began his public ministry. It was a time in his life where he was nearing the end of his public ministry and he had had a large number of unpleasant confrontations by these Pharisees who actually tried to kill him many times. They would take up stones during these last days of Jesus and try to kill him. And so now his, his ministry of confrontation of the Pharisees that he wanted to bring to himself had come to an end, and he withdrew from Jerusalem, from the temple, from Jerusalem, and he went back across Jordan, and the Bible says, uh, to the place where John at first baptized. So we find Jesus going back to the place where he began this wonderful ministry. And remember when he began it. He submitted to the hands of baptism, and baptism was a picture of death, burial, and resurrection. So when he began his public ministry, he made a commitment to a ministry that would culminate in death, burial, and resurrection. So it was a place of commitment. And if you're going back, is going to help you go forward, you need to have some places in your life, physically and spiritually, where you have made some valid, godly commitments. You know, I have the greatest esteem for people who make great commitments. By great, I mean of a spiritual nature. You know, one of the best ways to live up to every commitment you make is just to make little, sleazy commitments. It doesn't take anything to live up to a little, sleazy commitment. But you make a great commitment. And that's what Christians ought to be doing. Listen, I do not disrespect people who don't live up to great commitments. I respect people who make such great commitments to Christ that they can't really live up to all of them. Because our God said, Be ye therefore perfect. And I haven't met anybody yet that is perfect except Jesus. So Jesus went back to a real place and I don't know that he went back merely for refreshment, but let me tell you this. Jesus, while he was on earth, had the body of a man. And he needed to be refreshed. He had been under attack for weeks and for months, and he needed a place of retreat. So he went back to a specific place where he made a commitment. And because it was the right commitment and the right place, I believe, that he was refreshed for his coming final experience in Jerusalem where he would be crucified, you see. God was getting him ready. I wonder, would it be helpful to some of us if we could go back to the place where we first received Christ as our Savior? I think about the the basement or the cellar in our home in Memphis. I was born in New Orleans, but I was reared in Memphis. And on a Sunday night, when I was just a seven-year-old boy, my mother led me to Christ in the cellar of that home. That's where she usually took us to give us a spanking when we needed it. Of course, I didn't need one very often because I was such a sweet little boy. But that night... I had a conviction of sin, and it was on a Sunday night, and my mother led me to faith in Christ. And I've never been able to forget that specific place, and when I think about it, it is encouraging to me. And then I think about a place uh, in uh, North Carolina at a Baptist assembly, a place by the name of Pritchell Hall, where I was on my knees with a group of members from our church on a Saturday night after the lights were out. And uh, God touched my heart to preach the gospel. And it was a still, small voice, but I answered the voice. And I go back to that place 
in my mind, and I have been back there physically. And there is a specific place, and I wonder today, do you have a specific place? Maybe it was in this church five years ago where somebody prayed with you, or maybe you came down the aisle, and as you came, I prayed with you, and we, we helped you to open your heart, and you received Jesus. It's wonderful to have a specific place that you need that place. Because your life is under bombardment by the devil. And if you're out there in the workaday world, it's hard. It's tough being a Christian. And sometimes, and I think probably most of the time, the hardest place in the world to be a Christian is when you close the front door on your house. And you're on the inside. And your faith will be tried oftentimes more right uh, in your own home, among your own relatives, more difficultly than any other place in the world. It's wonderful to have a place where you can go to, where Jesus saved you, or where he called you to be a teacher, or where you made a commitment to tithe and put God first in your finances. And you go back to that place and you say, Lord, thank you. I could have just wasted my life and thrown it away, but you have given me something that is eternal and something that is worthwhile. Thank you, Lord. Jesus went back. He had been suffering. It had been difficult for him. But he went back to that place where John the Baptist introduced him. Behold, the Lamb of God. He takes away the sins of the whole world. He must increase, but I must decrease. And Jesus went back there, and the Bible says that um, many resorted unto him. That's that he was accepted. A place of commitment, a place of acceptance. You know, if we don't get acceptance in the right way, we're going to get it in the wrong way. I'm often grieved as I see church members getting to some kind of a club or some kind of an association with other human beings, uh, maybe educational, maybe just a hobby kind of a thing. But I know that in that group they're going to be accepted. They're going to be accepted because they like this sport or they like this hobby or they've gone off the deep end on this kind of a thing. And so they find in this whatever it is, acceptance. But it is just a, a hollow thing. And it's not really what the people need. But people do need acceptance. Jesus had been rejected. They had tried to kill him. He needed somebody to accept him. He really did. He really did. And you know, we do too. And God has made it possible in the church for us to be accepted in the beloved. And a church ought to be the most loving and is. A church is the most loving, accepting institution on earth. Now look, the church is imperfect. The church is not a perfect creation, but it is by far superior to anything else that is second on the face of this earth, so far as accepting and loving people for just being human beings. And I want to tell you, when you need to go back in order to go forward, you be faithful in church. And every time you are actively present in church, affirming and accepting people, you're going to be affirmed and accepted. Really, every time you attend church with the right spirit, what do you do? You are going back to that divine hitching post that says, hey, the world has slapped you in the face, but Jesus loves you. And God's people love you. And in that going back to church, and being faithful, you find a stability and a strength for your life that you never will find. Have you noticed in the paper, through the years and here lately, somebody commits a heinous crime? One of the things that they say almost consistently, oh, he was a nice guy, but he was a loner. Haven't you heard that over and over again? He was a good student, but he was a loner. Now, I want to tell you there's a difference between being a loner and being lonely. And in a sense, every Christian needs to know what it means to be lonely. In this sense, you're not saved because two or three other people agree to be saved, and so you agree to be saved. No. Now, maybe two or three other people were saved at the same time, but if you were saved, you made a singular decision. You made a lonely decision. And frequently, Christians are called upon to be the only person in this group that's a real Christian. The only person on this job that's a real Christian. Not that they're looking for some kind of sympathy, it's just a fact. That Christians oftentimes find themselves to be very lonely. 
They're not looking for it. They're not a loner in the sense that they want to just have nothing to do with any other human being. But they're not afraid to be lonely because serving Jesus oftentimes involves being alone. Let me tell you this. God has an answer for that. And that is the loving acceptance that you have in the body of Christ. And your desire to be accepted and to be affirmed and to be loved and be with people can be answered in God's wisdom through his local church. And every time you attend church, in a sense, you're going back in order to go forward, you see. Going backward to go forward. And then notice, going backward is not only a place of commitment and a place of acceptance, but it's a place of blessing because the Bible says, that many resorted unto him, and many believed on him there. And if we are going backward to go forward, what we're finding is this. Our going backward is not just longing for the good old days, when all people were nice and everything was going our way. And isn't it awful today, all of the awful things that people are doing? No, that's not it. It means that when you go back like God wants you to do, go back like Jacob did to Bethel and reaffirm those vows to God, Go back as Jesus did beyond Jordan to get ready for that Calvary experience that's just ahead. What you're going to find is in that kind of going back, instead of you ending up being a cynic in life, you're going to end up being a blessing. And when your soul is refreshed by the right kind of going back, then that will give you a motivation to thrust you forward, and people are going to be saved. Because you'll be going forward in a renewed power and a renewed vigor that God is able that he's able to do the impossible, that he is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that you ask or think. You see. And the Bible says that even though that many rejected him in Jerusalem, here at the Jordan where he went back, many believed on him there. And isn't that after all why Jesus saved us? That he might use us to be a blessing that many might believe on him there. I ask you today, do you have a place to go back to where you receive Jesus as your Savior? If not, you need to have a place. Do you have a place to go back to? I've heard people say, well, I was saved one time, but Jesus, I made Jesus Lord of my life at another place. Well, he ought to be Lord as when he saves you, but I can understand their, under, their growth in his Lordship. Maybe they, at that place, they said, Lord, anything. Uh, some have called it a second blessing. Some have called it a third and a fourth and a fifth blessing. But we need places, spiritual places, that we can go back to. Do you have any of those places? Either physically or that you can go back to in your mind? God wants you to have those places. You need to have some places where you made great commitments. And if you don't, then you can make that place today. Day, November the 3rd, 1991, here at Lake Forest Baptist Church. This can be your time and your place that you can come back to so far as so long as you live, for you made a great commitment for the glory of God. I'll be here to counsel with you. Come as the Lord leads. Stand together for our hymn of invitation. Come right now.